would do to have the kind of faith it takes to climb out of this boat I'm in onto the crashing waves to step out of my comfort zone to the realm of the unknown where Jesus is and he's holding out his hand but the waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me reminding me of all the times I've tried before and failed the waves that keep on telling me time and time again sling at the stone surrounded by the sound of a thousand warriors shaking in their armor wishing they'd had the strength to stand but the giant's calling out my name and he laughs at me reminding me of all the times I've tried before and failed the giant on telling me time and time again, child, you'll never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, Do not be afraid. And the voice of truth says, This is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me. choose to listen and believe I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth Amen let's stand we're going to sing together worship the Lord together let's sing he will hold me fast
what a wonderful assurance to know that we are safe in the hands of Christ. It's tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Let's sing that next. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. tonight. We're glad that you're here. Let's go Lord in prayer and ask this blessing. Brother Rick, would you leave some prayer, please? Blessed Father, we enjoy the gift of your presence within us, liberty and unity you provide for us. The Holy Spirit that abides within us, teaching us of yourself, directing us to the gift of Jesus Christ. We pray that please take these few feeble offerings that we have here tonight as we worship, that you would draw men to yourself, able to be there so we have a gift to say thank you thank you for all that you do for us ladies and we appreciate the things that you do that we see but also the things that you do that we don't see I know how much you pray for us because I get to see an inside view but um, just so many things that you do for us and us ladies would like to thank you for that oh that's right um, thank you so much, ladies. This is really, really sweet of you. But honestly, you, you ladies make it easy to serve alongside with you and to love you. And I, I do. I love you and I pray for you. And just thankful that God um, can 
allow me to be here uh, with you all. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing again tonight, if you would. We'll let you remain seated for this one. We'll have the worship team come and help me. We're going to sing His Eye is on the Sparrow. Isn't it good to know the Lord is always watching over us? And just some songs to remind us of that tonight. He will hold me fast. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and His eye is on the sparrow. Let's sing it together. Why should I seated. Thank you so much helping us out tonight. I just wanted to mention that coming up in June, we have a couple things going on, but on June the 19th, we'll have Dr. Don Sisk with us, and Dr. Sisk is coming to be with us Sunday morning, and then Sunday night, he'll preach our school graduation, and then we're going to do some special meetings Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week, all right? And uh, I, I've been, I was really struggling with what to do. You say, why did you invite him up in June? Uh, just because I wanted to hear uh, one more time from him, you know, he's 88 years old now, he's still preaching every single week, still does all his own scheduling, so he says sometimes I'm flying all over the world because I don't do very well with that, but uh, you pray for him, he's, we just saw him last week, he's slowing down for sure, 
and uh, but still has that sparkle in his eye. And I just wanted to hear from the wisdom of a man that served the Lord for 70 years now. And so it'll be a blessing to you, and I'll encourage you to be here. And so I, I struggled with what to do. We've always had him re- preach missions conference. He was a missionary to Japan. He was you know, the head of Baptist International Missions Incorporated for years and years and years. And I just, just praying about that, but instead I said, no, we're just going to do revival meetings. We're just going to have him preach. I just want to hear what else he has. I just want to be, just learn from him. And so I encourage you to be here, but I'm going to ask you to do this. Would you start praying about those meetings now? All right? So we'll do Sunday morning, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night will be kind of revival type meetings. And then it may not be typical revival. We're not going to have a guy uh, blowing the roof off as he's preaching. It'll be an 88-year-old gentleman that is filled with the Spirit of God. I promise you that. And he will come in the power of the Spirit of God, and it will be a, a blessing uh, to you, I'm sure. And so that'll be Sunday morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, June 19th, 20th, 21st, and 22nd, I believe are the dates. And so you'll want to be here for that. But let's start praying now that God will do something in our hearts throughout that time that we just set it apart for the Lord. And uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to have him speak to our, our school students. And uh, it'll be good for them. And we'll do a chapel that week with the kids and we'll do different things uh, and, and get as much as we can out of uh, that, those meetings. Now, uh, Noah is going off, Noah Vard is going off to West Coast Baptist College in the fall, and so he'll be under uh, Brother Sisk for part of the missions classes that he'll take, and so that'll be just a double blessing uh, for that young man as he learns from Brother Sisk, all right? So would you start praying, all right? Start doing that now, and what we're going to do on June 18th on the Saturday night before, we're going we're gonna to have, we always have prayer here on Saturday nights. We're going to have a special prayer meeting that night, invite as many as we can, and we're going to come and just pray and pray and pray and ask God to do a special work. I I, I know we, we we, we do that for revival meetings. We ought to be doing that every service. Every service, God can save somebody. And every service, God can move and revive a heart, and he can do different things. We ought to really do that, but we try to put those special emphasis, I guess, just to kind of get us moving and get us out of our rut. And, and so would you start focusing on that, start praying about those meetings? And I'd appreciate so much just praying for every service between now and then. And even after that, keep praying that God will work. All right, Donna, you come and see. She read the story about Jesus and the woman at the well. She found herself inside those pages and wondered how she could have got so far gone. So far away from home, and she cried out. step down from here Slay 
You know, the Bible says that if he would send his son, what other thing would he withhold? What could he withhold that he gave his son, Jesus Christ? I'm so thankful tonight. Turn, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something that happened this week. Um, it has nothing to do with the message, and, and perhaps, I, I don't know if it's the right time or not, but a merry heart doeth good like medicine. And uh, it made me laugh. And is Calvin in here? It's not, it's not about Calvin. It's about his son. It's about his son. And uh, <laughs> Toby, Toby, you know Toby, th- little guy, three years old, four years old now. He had watched his mom painting her toenails. So he thought he would paint his toenails. But he couldn't find anything but peanut butter. So he painted his toenails with peanut butter. And so I was in a store the other day, and they had Jif peanut butter on sale. So I took a picture, and I said, hey, Calvin, they got nail polish on sale over here. <laughs> you should come and get some. But I thought that was, I don't know why. I just think it's so funny that his masculine little boys are painting their nails. But <laughs> amen. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I just want to share a couple things about the message before we start tonight. I'm going to spend a lot of time in introduction and teaching, all right? And then I'm going to preach real short, and it's just going to be three questions of application, all right? That's when preaching comes in is when we make the application, right? Uh, And that's the difference. Teaching is informational, and preaching is transformational, and so we're going to take the, the Bible knowledge that we have, and then we're going to try to apply it. But it's going to take some teaching because we're going to look at all seven churches of Revelation. All right? We'll do it very quickly, and you're going to have to listen very quickly because I'm going to read through uh, each church, make just a few comments, and then we're going to draw some comparisons and some contrasts, and then I'm going to ask you three questions that have to do with all seven churches. All right? And, and you'll, you'll understand a little better as we go, but I don't want you to think, okay, we're getting bogged down here because I think the background is important to the context of the message tonight, all right? So let's look at Revelation chapter 1, and we're just going to read a few verses here, and then we will jump uh, down to chapter 2, all right? Revelation chapter 1, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Make sure you understand that. My Bible, just probably like yours, is the revelation of St. John Divine, or the revelation of John the Revelator, or the Apostle John, or something like that. But it is, in fact, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So understand this, when the book of Revelation was written in John chapter 1, verse 1, everything was in the future. Everything was in the future. All right? Now, there are seven existing churches, but he's going to talk about those things that are in those churches currently, the things which are, the things which shall come, and the things which are thereafter. And we'll look at that in a moment. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So the revelations from Jesus Christ through the apostle John. Verse 3, blessed is he that readeth and now that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever 
Amen. So notice who the content of this letter is from. The Bible says it's from Jesus Christ. It says it's from the prophet uh, uh, John as he is prophesying under the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about, if, if I can call him this, the Ancient of Days, the one who was and is and is to come. And verse 5 again, reemphasizing from Jesus Christ. And so we, we have a lot of power behind this letter that's about to come. We have God the Father, God the Son, we know inspired by the Holy Spirit, and through the earthly prophet, John. Now notice who it is addressed to. It says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. All right, the churches that are in Asia. Now we're going to look at those seven churches in just a moment. And, and most biblical scholars believe they also represent not only churches that existed on earth during those days, but seven periods of church history that would pass out throughout time until the end of the ages. All right, so let's look first of all uh, at verse 12. Look there with me, if you will. The Bible talks about John, this, uh, John the Revelator, and he says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now mark that in your mind, seven golden candlesticks. We'll find out what those are in a moment. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, somebody might say that, see that phrase and say, well, we don't know for sure if that's the Son of Man or not, because it says he's like unto the Son of Man. Those are comparison words, and so we look at that and we say, well, we just don't know for sure. Keep reading. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, and if they burned in a furnace, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of the mouth, out of his mouth, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So now we start to get a hint of who this is, don't we? The Bible says he was like as unto the Son of Man. He was like the Son of Man. And it describes his appearance, his hair is white like wool, and it talks about the sword that goeth out of his mouth as a two-edged sword. And, but now he begins to speak, this one that is walking among the candlesticks, he says, fear not, I am the first and the last. We know right away he's God. We may not know just yet if he is God the Father, God the Son, or who he might be, but we know he's God because he is the first and the last. There is no other one who has ever lived who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega, he is God. All right, so make sure we know that. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Now we're getting a clearer picture, aren't we? There's only one part of the Godhead who was alive and who died and who's alive again forevermore, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we can know for certain who it is that is among these candlesticks. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Donna just sang about that a moment ago. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Now, we said a moment ago, to mark it in your mind, we'd find out what these candlesticks are. Let's read. It tells us right here. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, or the messengers. That's what the word angels means right there. The messengers of the seven churches. Now, look what he says next. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So these candlesticks that John has prophesied about and he has seen in this vision on the Lord's day are seven churches. They are the seven churches of Asia. I, I don't know in my mind if, if um, I'm kind of analytical and I, I almost picture a map that appears to John and, and God puts seven golden 
candlesticks on that map to show where these, I don't know if that's how it happened or not. But the Bible talks about how this one, uh, this ancient of days, this beginning and the end, this son of man, he was walking among those candlesticks and we see what he is doing. Verse chapter two, he begins to write, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So notice what he's doing. The Bible says he's walking in the midst. He is there examining his churches. After all, they are his, right? They belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the preeminent one in the church. He is the head of all things that consist. He is the head of the local church. And, and so he is, he is examining all these seven churches. And I would say this tonight. Uh, if Christ was concerned about these seven churches, he's also concerned about this church. And he examines this church. And he wants to know that if we can be tried by fire, if we will come out the other side, a biblical and a right church. That's what God does. And so he identifies himself as he addresses every church in a different way. But each time he addresses himself to the churches, he takes just a line from what we've already read in chapter 1. And this time, he's the one that holds the seven stars in his right hand. He is the one that walketh in the midst of the seven golden sticks, candlesticks. And so now I want you to notice the seven churches. We've given you just a little bit of a background of what's going on. Jesus Christ judging his churches. Look at the first church, the church at Ephesus. We're going to read through these very quickly so that we can understand what is going on. So the first letter is the church to the church at Ephesus, and I've called it this, the church that lost its purpose. The church that lost its purpose. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things shall, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my namesake hast labored and hast not fainted. So the Lord Jesus Christ is looking at the church at Ephesus, and he's found a lot of good things to be thankful for. And then in verse 4 he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of, this, out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hast the, hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God." So notice the church at Ephesus, the church that lost its purpose. They had done a lot of good things. He, he says they were patient and they labored and they, and they had done a lot of good things. They, they, they identified those evil speakers and those that were evil and they shunned them from the church. They, they wanted a pure church and a good church. But he says this, you have lost your first love. How does that happen? They've put all their emphasis on those other things thinking they could please Christ with all those works and forgotten to have a relationship with him personally. That's how that takes place. And I, I gotta be honest with you, we, I, I, there's been a lot of times where I've sat down with the staff and we've had to say, listen, are our programs getting too big? Are, are we getting to the point where we're so busy that we're not focusing on Christ like we ought to be? Is it about the fun time and the programs? And we talked about this a little bit this morning. Or do we truly have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that the preeminent thing in our church? And in the programs that we do have, are they designed to point us to a greater relationship with Christ and to make sure that we are drawing closer to him and being discipled and, and growing in the Lord? Because Ephesus, they lost their purpose when they left their first love. 
And then we see the next letter to the church at Smyrna in verse 8. It says, and unto the angel of the church at Smyrna, write, these things saith the first and the last. And so he identifies himself with another little tidbit of the, of the descriptions of John back in chapter 1. Uh, Thus, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and that he may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The church at Smyrna is the church that was persecuted. We actually don't read anything negative about them. The Lord Jesus Christ is simply cheering them on. It's often that we see that in this world, a persecuted church is a pure church. A persecuted church is the one that is spreading the gospel. A persecuted church is the one that that is doing their very best to be pleasing unto Christ. And they've stripped away all the ornaments of Christendom and they just focus on Christ. And Smyrna was the persecuted church as Ephesus was the church that lost its purpose. And then we see Pergamos, the church that was perverted. Look at chapter, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things that he would, uh, these things saith he, which the, with the sharp, uh, sorry, let me start that verse over. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. And so there's some positive things. And hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So they too have suffered some persecution. And one named Antipas has died as a martyr. And he says, you've held fast my name. You've not denied my faith. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth." He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a a white stone, and in the stone a new name written that no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Pergamos was the church that was perverted because their doctrine was perverted. It was twisted and turned, and though they held fast the name of Christ, and they held true to certain things of the faith, the Bible says they also accepted the doctrine of Balaam. And the Nicolaitans, and and they were a stumbling block unto Balak towards their people. So they intermingled these false gods. And the Bible calls that fornication, adultery against God, spiritual adultery. So they were the church that was perverted. Then we come to Thyatira in verse 18. And the church of Thyatira was the church that entertained false prophets. And under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity, well, that's a good thing, and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that committed adultery with her into a great tribulation, except thou repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, 
As many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule uh, them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." Like the church at Pergamos, Thyatira entertained false doctrine, but not only that, they allowed false prophets in to teach among their people. False, false prophets led to false worship. They were accused of adultery and fornication. It was spiritual because they were showing their affections to false gods. And then we see the church at Sardis in chapter 3 and verse 1. And Sardis was the church that was proud. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou wast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defied their, defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life." <coughs> But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath the ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sardis was the church that was proud. They said, I have a name that I'm alive. And they were proud of that image that they are the church of the living God. But God says, I've looked at your hearts and I know that you're really dead. There's no spiritual life in you. We come across a lot of churches like that today. Is my hope and prayer that we are not one of them. I remember years ago, and I, I, I've told you this many times, picking up a sermon from a church that we rented from, uh, the United Church of Canada, and the minister had written a sermon about sin and salvation. And when it came to salvation, the question was asked, and it was all in manuscript, and he said this. He said, it would take a stark fundamentalist to ask the question, are you saved? And it would take somebody even crazier to know how to answer that. I thought, how sad a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ does not know how to tell somebody how to be saved. We are living in a day of powerless Christianity. The Bible says, from such turn away, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That was the church of Sardis. They clung to their works, but they could not see that their garments were dirty. Then we come in verse 7 to the church of Philadelphia. This was the church that was preserved. Verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which thou shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man can take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is now uh, New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Like the churches, Smyrna, the church of Philadelphia, God said nothing negative about them. As a matter of fact, they were a church that were to be preserved. The Bible says they were kept because they obeyed God's word in verse 8. They were humble. He says, oh, you have a little strength. But in their weakness, he was made strong. They had a little strength. 
They were a humble church. They were an obedient church. They were a faithful church. And because of it, they were, God said twice, he's opened doors before them. They were given great opportunity. But then we come to the last church that John would address, and it's the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea have entitled the church that was pitiful. Notice what it says about them. And under the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things that saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Laodicea was the church that was pitiful. They were the lukewarm church. They were neither hot nor cold. In verse 17, we read of their problems. They say that I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They had lied to themselves thinking that their blessings were the hand of God upon them. Their prosperity did not indicate their spirituality. God says you're miserable and poor and naked and blind. And I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. The biggest problem of this church was that Jesus was on the outside looking in. I can almost hear the Lord Jesus Christ as he's knocking on the door. Is there one in there that knows me? If there's even one that'll open the door... I'd be glad to come in and sup with you. Is there one? But nobody answered the door. There wasn't one in the church of Laodicea. They were so lukewarm in their faith that God would spew them out of their mouth. I want you to notice some similarities that we see in these seven churches. Number one, Jesus knows their works. Not only will every man give himself, give an account of himself unto God, but every church will too. The spiritual temperature of our church is being taken all the time by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the one that holds the stars in his hand and walks among the candlesticks. And he's judging the churches and he knows. That's not such a stretch of our imagination. We believe in a God that is everywhere at once. He is omnipresent. We believe in a God that dwells within us. And if you're a child of God tonight, Jesus Christ is very much present in your life and here in this place. And we believe that and we know that he is looking to be honored and praised and glorified. So Jesus knows the works of all these churches. They were churches because they were an assembly of saved people. Some of these congregations were described as having some false prophets and some who had crept in and they were posing as something they were not. There were some that were trusting in their works. But if God called them churches, then at their core, each of them had to have at least some saved people or else they would not be churches. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, I will remove your candlestick. And if he had not yet removed it, there was still some saved people there. That's who Jesus is calling to in Revelation 20 as he stands at the door and knocks. He's calling to revive the lukewarm. He's looking for those that still desire to have fellowship with him and invite him in. And their church was so full of everything else but Christ. And he's pleading with them to let me in. 
at their core, there were still some safe people. Now, there were seven churches that we read tonight. Five of those churches had some faults. The Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia, Christ did not list any faults. That doesn't mean they were perfect necessarily, but Christ did not list any of their faults. He praised them only. Those five churches that were listed, we see, first of all, Ephesus had lost its love for Christ. Pergamus had allowed false doctrine uh, to minimize Christ. Thyatira had allowed false prophets to lead them away from Christ. Sardis had allowed sin to penetrate, and they viewed their works as more important than Christ. And Laodicea mistook their wealth as the blessing of God, but left Christ on the outside looking in. Make no mistake about it. Everything we do either exalts Christ or minimizes Christ. And that's what all the sin of these five churches did. It minimized or took Christ right out of the church in some form or capacity. That's what sin does. Notice also, the first six churches that were listed had a remnant. Ephesus... He says, you're standing against false doctrine. That's good. For the church at Smyrna, he says, they were the godly persecuted church. For the church of Pergamus, they hold fast to God's name. They, they didn't deny the faith. For Thyatira, they, they were known for their charity and their service and their faith. There was a remnant that would not be accountable for the sins of the others, it says. For Sardis, God says, strengthen The things that remain, implying that there were still some holding to the truth. The church of Philadelphia was a godly church. But the church at Laodicea, there's absolutely nothing positive said. With all the churches, except for two, there was something negative. For all the other six, there was something positive. But for Laodicea, there was nothing I believe there was something positive for the other six because Christ was still in. But for the church of Laodicea, Christ was on the outside. They had left him out completely. They didn't consult him in prayer. They didn't seek him in worship. They didn't glorify him in their lives. They were not a church. They were nothing more than a social club in the name of Christ. And they just very by the slimmest of margins, were holding on to that candlestick. Perhaps there was a preacher that was still trying to preach to get the folks to do right. Maybe there was a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or somebody that was crying out saying, we need Christ in this church. I can't tell you how many people I've met in apostate churches that have said, well, we're just staying here and trying to help. We're trying to get it back on track. We're trying to fight the apostasy. Maybe there was somebody that allowed them to hold on to that candlestick. I want to say this tonight. If anything, we must avoid at all costs being a Laodicean church. I I don't really want to be the other four churches that were failing either. I I don't want to be the church at Ephesus that, that had left their first love. I don't want to be the church of Pergamus that, that, that had some faults against them. I, I don't want to be the Thi- church of Thyatira that allowed false prophets in to speak. I don't want to be any of them. But I never want to get to that point, especially where Christ is on the outside. I've, I've been on vacation and popped into places. And seen all kinds of crazy things happen in the name of Christ. But still somehow you could come away and say, you know, there was a lot of crazy things today, but that, that preacher loved the Lord. That Sunday school teacher, man, they did a good job. There was just something about their spirit today. My wife and I were on vacation several years ago. Matter of fact, it was... Uh, she was, she was nine months pregnant with Emily, so it's been a while. Emily would be 24 this year. We were up north, and uh, we'd gone to church 
in the, in the morning with uh, Dr. Pipe and went to, to his church up there in Pembroke. And, uh, and then that evening, they didn't have an evening service. It was summertime and they didn't have an evening service. And so we went, we just wanted to go to church. We'd been up there for a week and it was quiet and we were looking for things to do. There's not a lot to do up in Pembroke, to be honest with you. We fished a lot, which was fine. But we decided we want to go to church somewhere. And so we said, well, let's do this. There was a church out on the highway. And please don't pick up tomatoes and stone me right now or anything, all right? It was a Pentecostal church. I said, I've heard a lot about it, but I've never been in one. I've never seen one. Let's go. Like a learning experience. Let's just go learn. And, and Brendan was only a year and a half old. We said, he's not going to learn anything. It's not going to hurt him or nothing. And so we went. I want to tell you, the choir opened up and sang. It was incredible. Powerful. They asked the deacon if he would stand and open in prayer. And when he stood, a quiet hush fell over that room. And those, didn't it, honey? The Spirit of God moved in. And he prayed for about 10 minutes. And it didn't seem pretentious. It wasn't one of those cases where a Pharisee was getting up to try to everybody hear his big words. It wasn't that at all. The whole crowd just hushed and prayed and wept. We opened up a hymn book and sang hymns. The preacher got up and preached a fantastic message that night. We never saw anybody rolling in the aisles. We didn't hear anybody speaking in tongues. We didn't hear any of that. And we left and we thought, wow, what a service. I know that there's things that go on in, in churches of different doctrines. I get that. I understand that. That's what we kind of actually went hoping to see that. I'm going to be honest with you. We wanted to under, see it for ourselves and learn what, what is that like? What is it all about? We hear about it. We've been taught about it in Bible college, but what does it look like? But instead, we came away saying, there's some people that love God up here. They love the Lord. And I think when I look at these churches in Revelation, I think we could probably go to each of those churches. We could go to Ephesus, and we could go to the different places, and we could say, you know what? That place was a mess. This one, this one was a doctrinal mess. That, I mean, they had, some good, they had some good classes and they had a good preacher baby, but that one Sunday school teacher, that, that's a false prophet right there. And that church over there, you know, the, ch the church at, the, at Smyrna, they, they're persecuted, but boy, can they sing and they love the Lord. And the church over here at Thyatira, they, they've got some doctrinal issues, but boy, there's a few people there that they're, they're weeping at the altar and they're praying and they're begging God to restore their church and to turn that thing around. And I think if we went to all these churches, we could say, hey, we don't agree with everything and we don't like everything we saw and there's some serious problems in those churches, but there's a core of people that love the Lord and they're trying to get things back on the right track and they want to see God move and they want to see God's blessing and they want to see folks saved, except for that church at Laodicea. That's just a room of cold people, lukewarm. God himself could not find one good thing to say about them. Isn't that sad? That's the church that we must avoid at all costs. Every time I come to church, I want to meet with God. We ought to meet with them in our prayer and our devotions and our, our quiet times. But I, I don't want to come to church and sing and Jesus isn't listening. I don't want to come and pray and think that he's not hearing. I want to come to church and know his presence. And so let me ask you three questions that God laid upon my heart about these seven churches. Number one. And here's, here's the application. Are we unconcerned? Laodicea was indifferent. They were lukewarm. I would dare say that Jesus Christ on the outside looking in did not start out that way. Laodicea started like any other church. By the way, 
all of these churches started during the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They weren't that old. The oldest they possibly could be was from the resurrection of Christ after the day of Pentecost. 60 years, and now John's writing. This is how quickly they have denigrated, how quickly they've fallen away in just a generation, a generation and a half. Here they are looking for Christ. I believe that the church of Laodicea slid like it did because of their indifference. They didn't care anymore. They said, well, that's, that's not us, preacher. We're not indifferent. We're not lukewarm. Ask yourself the question. If I open the hymn book tonight and I pull out Amazing Grace, does your heart leap with joy to think you can sing about the grace of our God? Or do you say, I have sang this 15 times a year for the 40 years that I've been here. I'm so tired of that old hymn. Just ask yourself, are you lukewarm? Are you indifferent? Hey, let me tell you something, folks. This morning, George Peters walked the aisle and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and and we just go... Now, I've been here 60 years. I've seen thousands saved. That's, that's no big deal. Are we indifferent? Are we lukewarm? We talk about so many things that we're fearful of because, oh, that's a slippery slope. The greatest slippery slope you'll be seeing in the Bible is being lukewarm. Being indifferent to the things that God has given us. not praising him for what he's done, not thanking him for all his many blessings. We've just become cold and indifferent. I'm not, I'm not placing that upon you tonight. I'm just asking you, are you unconcerned? That's what I see in a lot of these churches. Here's the second question. Are you unclean? Some of the church's problem was just flat out Sin. It wasn't that they became complacent or indifferent. They just sinned. Sin always grieves the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the superintendent of the church. He is what empowers the church we read in Acts chapter 2. He is the one that has come and he unites the church. And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, it's because of sin. All five of the churches that rebuked had a sin problem. Let me ask you. What have you brought with you into the sanctuary today? We rose up this morning saying, I'm going to meet with God. What are you bringing? I'm not, I'm not saying that we should use those uh, things in our lives. I hear so many people say, well, I'll go to church when I get right with God. And when I, when I get some things taken care of, I'll start going back to church. And I understand what, what they're saying. And we say, no, Come. Get under the word of God and and get your hearts right. But listen, if you're a mature Christian today, I want you to know this. The the great high priest, he cleansed himself and the Levites cleansed themselves and sanctified themselves before they went to the house of God. Because he said, we're going to meet with the most holy God. If you know that that's who you're going to see, we say, well, I wonder why I go to church and I never meet with him. Are you unclean? The lepers had to stay outside the camp. They weren't allowed in. Are you unclean? Are you cleansed? Here's the third question that comes up. Are you unconcerned? Are you unclean? Are you unfocused? A couple of these churches had focus problems. They were focused on false doctrine rather than the word of God. Are we focused on worshiping Christ or are there false prophets of our day that have your attention? A false prophet doesn't have to be somebody that's getting up and and start preaching doctrines that are contrary to the word. Paul said to Timothy that this know in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of themselves. That's a false prophet. When we prioritize our 
wants and our heart's desires and the, the sins of our flesh and the lust of our eyes and all those things, our pride. When we prioritize that over worshiping Christ. Well, I'll preach, I'd, I'd worship the Lord more if you had church at a better time or if it was just more convenient. I, I think it ought to be inconvenient. I think it ought to be something that we say, I'm going to schedule because I'm going to give Christ the number one time slot in my week. I'm going to show he's more important to me than anything else. What are we prioritizing? Are we focused on the right things? As I said before, I believe this happened very quickly. This falling away of these five churches... I don't think if you were to say to any of them as they first started under perhaps the Apostle Paul or maybe Timothy ordained an elder in one of them or maybe Titus went out and helped the church get organized or what have you, I don't think they would have ever thought at those moments 60 years from now they'll be writing about my sin in the book of Revelation. Just a generation just a short time. Both this morning and tonight, I've preached along the same lines that we have to be very careful about the next generation. We have to make sure that we are instilling in them a heart for Christ, a heart for God, a love for Christ and a love for God. Not, it's, it's not about, we, we have all the programs in the world, it's not about the programs. And if I think for one minute that those programs aren't bringing people to Christ and helping them grow and pointing them to Christ, we're scrapping it. It's finished. Several years ago, I went to a funeral here in town. A friend of mine had an aunt pass away. And so I, I went to the funeral just to support. And uh, the aunt had been in a rock band and so before the service started, this rock band was set up in the church sanctuary. And just, I mean, just rocking out. And then the priest, Anglican priest, came dancing down the aisle in a long robe and got up at the front and picked up a microphone and started singing rock music with them and dancing around. The Bible never got opened we were there two hours. The Bible was never opened. The name of Christ was never uttered, not once, in a local church in this community. Not once. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here tonight to call them out. I'm just telling you the facts. In two hours, it was a rock concert, and it was tributes about her life and the good that she did and not one thing about Jesus. Did they start out that way? I don't know. But I know this, you can slide real quick. By just simply being indifferent, lukewarm, unfocused on Christ, allowing everything else to get in the way, and not being single-minded about Jesus. That is our focus, and that is our goal. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Lord, the Bible talks about books in heaven. And I know it's the names of people and their deeds and their works. But I wonder if there's a book similar to Revelation about his churches. But I do know that the first and the last is walking around judging his churches. Wanting to know if we are right and biblical. Lord, that's the desire of my heart. I don't know if we've got it right or not. I don't know if we're, I certainly know we're not perfect. I pray that you'd help us, show us how we can be more like a Bible church. More like Christ. So speak to our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, as we come to our invitation that we would just take some time and 
evaluate our own lives and ask, are we indifferent? Are we lukewarm? Is there that spark of revival yet within us? Are we focused on Christ when we come here? Is that our purpose? So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us as a church to remain faithful and true. Lord, I'm thankful for the, it'll be 90 years this year this church has been here. 95, really, for the years that before they organized and met in storefronts and such. Lord, I pray that we would have, remain faithful and true to the Lord Jesus Christ returns. But Lord, that only comes by your grace. So we pray that you'd help us. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed. I'm just going to be silent let the Holy Spirit speak to your hearts. And if God has spoke, would you pray?